the rise of humanity. 100,000 years would pass before humanity returned to the stars. During the long ages that followed Halo's activation, the inhabitants of Earth, confined to their cradle world, lost all knowledge of the Forerunners and of their own forebears' ancient history. Only in the 20th century would humans escape Earth's atmosphere and once again ascend into the inky depths of space. First, in the lower reaches of Earth's orbit, then to other worlds in the Sol system, and eventually turning their thoughts to stars that were once out of reach. By 2080, Earth's nations had put together joint efforts to colonize Luna, Mars, and a handful of other sites in the Sol system. Despite the daunting technological challenge of embedding sustainable populations on these worlds, new scientific innovations eventually made it a reality, and the interplanetary colonies saw growth and prosperity during these early years. In the mid-22nd century, two militant movements emerged among Earth's colonies dramatically altering the political landscape. The first, originating in Mars's mining city of Onotria, was known as the Koslaviks, after Vladimir Koslov and his family. They were miners turned activists, railing against what they saw as financial exploitation by the corporations that dominated the colony. After the violent takeover of three major mining facilities, the Koslaviks were deemed terrorist by the United Nations. Their ideas, however, gained momentum across Mars and rural parts of Luna. Among people who felt government-sponsored companies were violating the rights of colonists. The other hostile ideology the Freedom Movement grew out of Catrius, a major city on the Jovian moon Europa. Although the term Freedian is German for peace, the movement quickly escalated to violence. In 2158, the Freedians targeted an embassy in the European city of Thynia leveling the structure with military-grade explosives. As with the Kozlovics, the United Nation labeled the Freydians terrorists and dispatched UN colonial advisors to the Jovian moon of Io to help organize policing efforts. In the years that followed, few colonists remained neutral and both militant groups grew rapidly in support and resources. The United Nations lacked the military capability to prevent this, and the Koslovics and Freydians spread their influence and activities largely unchecked across Mars, Luna, and the Jovian moons. Eventually, the two sides clashed, due to their directly opposing politics. By 2160, the terrorist campaigns had escalated to full-scale war. As the factions fought the Jovian moon campaigns, foreshadowing the devastating interplanetary war. The brutal and harrowing interplanetary war waged primarily between the Koslovics and the Freydians, spanned much of the Sol system. The war would forever change the way Earth and her colonies were governed. Of particular significance was the formation of the United Nations Space Command, a powerful unified military force designed to subdue colonial hostilities.
The death toll of the Jovian Moons campaign was substantial, but by late 2161, the battle between the Kozlovics and the Fradians had subsided. The bloodshed ceased for several months, and some speculated that the worst had passed. In February 2162, however, a series of bombings in South America began a 19-month conflict that would become known as the Rainforest Wars. Engagements spread across the entire continent, reigniting violence throughout this whole system. In November of 2163, the Fradians suffered a critical loss, as their leader, Nadia Mielke, was assassinated on her way to a command center in the Europa city called Pelagon. This enraged the Fradians, and in December they retaliated with nearly all the military assets at their disposal. A large-scale campaign against Argre Planitia, the hub of a Kozlovic activity on Mars, obliterated the city within hours. More fighting occurred during the weeks that followed as the Kozlovic forces scattered into the city's outskirts. The United Nations had by now formed a composite military force which would eventually be called the United Nations Space Command, or UNSC, and deployed it to the Martian territories, most combative intense areas. By January 2164, the conflict historically known as the Interplanetary War had officially begun. The battle on Mars lasted two full years, as the United Nations bombed Kozlovic remnants, stamping out any Martian opposition. Despite the vast death toll, there was little concern on Earth of the ethics of these strikes. Most felt that they were justified as a way to prevent violence from spreading on their own soil. Although the Kozlovic suffered extensive losses in the early parts of the Martian assault, they continued to thrive on Luna and in isolated parts of Earth. In August 2167, however, Vladimir Kozlov and his family were killed in a bombing near Lake Autolycus on Luna. While the UNSC denied involvement, many believed that the Fradians were not capable of carrying out such an attack. Whatever the cause, this act severed the head of the Kozlovic movement. Despite some difficulty on the UNSC's part, Europa, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto all saw large-scale invasions by marine forces, resulting in the destruction of hundreds of Fradian bases and weapon caches. The last of the Fradians fought savagely under Oscar Bauer, nephew of Nadia Mielke, but by mid-2169, little remained of their movement. Before long, the last vestiges of both the Kozlovics and the Fradians was apprehended by the UNSC. The United Nations pinned the Callisto Treaty a ceasefire agreement that gave the UNSC complete military jurisdiction in all colonial territories. The treaty was signed in March 2170 on the Jovian moon of Callisto. With it, a single authority came into existence called the Unified Earth Government, or the UEG. This would be the seat of power and governance for all of Earth's colonies in the future. Often referred to as the colonial era, the Domus Diaspora is remembered as the greatest colonization effort of humans in history. 
with the development of faster than light travel through what was known as slipstream space, humanity gained access to distant worlds, leaving the Sol system to voyage into the deep. They inhabited remote star systems scattered across the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy. In 2362, centuries after the interplanetary war, the very first extrasolar colonization vessel, the Odyssey, launched from its mooring platform in orbit above Luna, alongside nearly 100 other colony ships. In the weeks that followed, these vessels arrived at their destinations and began the elaborate and protracted process of terraforming alien worlds. This vast exodus was organized by the UEG's Colonial Administration Authority after many long years of preparation. The first extrasolar planet reached by humans was Epsilon Eridani II, aptly named Reach by its first inhabitants. In the decades to come, it would become humanity's colonial center of military power. A number of other colonies were established within Epsilon Eridani system, including both tribute and circumstance, and comparatively smaller colonies in other star systems such as Belast, New Carthage, Actium, Luton, Mirdim, and Chiro. All of these were considered core worlds of inner colonies, strong, densely populated settlements closest to Earth via slip space travel. Outer colonies were those further from the human homeworld, such as Harvest, Coral, Madrigal, Second Base, Arcadia, and Green Hills. Many of these served as agricultural or mining colonies depending on the particular resources they provided. By the 26th century, over 800 individual colonies were spread across the Orion Arm, including planets, moons, asteroids, mining facilities, and relay stations. Humankind saw unprecedented growth and development during this time. Yet, despite this progress, hostilities broke out in some of the more remote settlements. A number of civilian uprisings against Earth's control occurred from 2475 to 2483. The response from the Colonial Military Administration, the CMA, was swift and severe but its heavy-handed tactics backfired, hardening resistance. Even stronger and more aggressive dissidents took to the political stage, beginning what would be the longest period of civil unrest humanity had ever seen. In 2487, the newly established People's Occupation and the Secessionists Union submitted formal requests on behalf of a dozen worlds demanding independence from Earth. With tensions rising on both sides, violence once again rocked the outer colonies. It was the Callisto incident that tipped the scales. In January 2494, the patrolling UNSC Callisto performed a routine inspection of a colonial vessel. It went tragically awry. Shots were fired and 30 colonists were killed. The entire region was spun into an uproar. Shortly afterwards, the Callisto was hijacked by local terrorists, who killed the crew and used the ship against UNSC forces. The UNSC responded aggressively. Having subdued and recaptured the ship, they cracked down across the territory, 
sparking rebellion throughout the outer colonies. The insurrection began. Guerrilla cells in the secessionist union assaulted colonial embassies and government buildings. And in June 2494, rebels under the leadership of ex-UNSC Marine Colonel Robert Watts orchestrated a series of military operations against the outer colony world Eridanus II. Before the CMA could respond, the local authorities had already been overrun by the secessionist union, and by January 2495, Eridanus II had been claimed by the rebels. This led to the UNSC's first full-scale response to the insurrection, Operation Charlemagne, a campaign to retake Eridanus II. UNSC successfully recaptured the colony and drove Watts and his forces into hiding. Victory, however, remained out of reach. Rebel forces continued their guerrilla campaign, inflicting massive losses. By the start of the 26th century, the UNSC changed tactics, initiating Operation Kaleidoscope a series of highly classified surgical strikes against prominent rebel leaders. Over the next five years, UNSC assassins targeted key rebel commanders, killing key figures such as Molin Sal, Gerald Onder, Standish Cable, and Eleanor Keff. By 2509, however, Many rebel cells had combined under the leadership of Robert Watts, proudly referring to themselves as the United Rebel Front. The UNSC and the Front continued to trade blows. A Watts-led invasion force retook Eridanus II in January of 2513. Months later, a UNSC battle group assaulted the planet and what would be the first part of Operation Trebuchet, a final brutal UNSC crackdown on all rebel activity. Although the loss of life was extraordinary, the UNSC won several notable victories, including the recapture of Eridanus II. Despite this, the turmoil and chaos of the insurrection continued unabated. It was becoming increasingly clear that conventional military means would not end this war. The insurrection left millions dead. Remarkably, the Civil War had been predicted as early as 2491 by Dr. Elias Carver. His study into the political and security situation of Earth and its colonies, known as the Carver Findings, pointed to the imminent breakdown of government and human space. Though Carver's report did not prevent the insurrection, it proved influential on some. Most notably, Dr. Catherine Halsey. With no end to the insurrection in sight, extreme measures were now being pursued. The most significant of these was the creation of the Spartans. Building on earlier successes, Dr. Halsey initiated the Spartan II project, full-scale production of biologically augmented, armor-enhanced super-soldiers. These Spartans became living legends, revolutionizing the art of war. Although they would play a major role in quelling the rebellion, a common threat would soon galvanize humanity and send the Spartans headlong into a conflict that would bring humanity to the brink of extinction. The insurrection proved that humanity's survival could not be secured by traditional military methods. Even before the rebellion, the UNSC's Office of Naval Intelligence, the ONI, had secretly launched the Orion Project, intending to engineer super soldiers, a precision combat force capable of stemming the tide of unrest swiftly and silently. 
but in 2506, for cost and performance reasons, ONI decided to abort Orion and reintegrate its personnel into the existing UNSC forces. By 2508, with the insurrection raging, ONI once again saw the need to revisit this unconventional strategy. They recruited Dr. Catherine Halsey, a young but brilliant scientist who would not balk at taking whatever steps necessary to achieve ONI's goals. Halsey set into motion two parallel projects, Spartan II and Mjolnir, both of equal significance to her designs. Halsey believed that the effective super soldiers needed to be cultivated at a young age. In September 2517, she initiated the first stage of her plan. Halsey selected children who had impressive strength, speed, and intellect, the most advanced six-year-olds across human space. The children were abducted and brought secretly to a highly classified training facility on the colony of Reach. To hide this crime, Owen and I replaced the children with rapidly grown Flash clones. This highly illegal procedure created convincing but short-lived replicas of the abductees. The clones all died soon after. On Reach, the abducted children were aggressively trained for years by the renowned drill instructor, Chief Petty Officer Franklin Mendez, learning a vast number of combat skills and tactics. In March 2525, Spartan II entered its second phase, the physical augmentation of each child forcing their bodies to receive a range of surgical and biochemical enhancements. The process was extremely traumatic, leaving many crippled or dead. Despite the loss of nearly half the candidates, the results were positive. The young Spartans were nothing short of extraordinary. Even at 14 years old, they were stronger more resilient and faster than any human before. This was proven in a raid on a rebel base hidden within the asteroid field near Eridanus II, in which the Spartans finally managed to capture the elusive rebel leader Colonel Robert Watts. The last phase was the integration of Project Mjolnir, the most advanced combat armor system ever created by humans. Mjolnir Mark IV armor was developed on the distant world of Chai Chedi IV and entered the final stages of production in November 2525. The melding of biologically enhanced super soldiers with state-of-the-art armor marked the completion of the Spartan II program, resulting in the most remarkable soldiers the species had ever produced. Almost immediately, both man and machine were tested, as the Spartans were called to defend Chai Chedi IV from a newfound enemy. The creation of the Spartans came at the most critical hour in human history. Although they had been devised to end the insurrection, this handful of warriors would be humanity's best defense against a far more menacing foe, the Covenant. It was only by extraordinary chance that a patrolling Covenant vessel stumbled across a human trade route adjacent to the Epsilon Indy star system. Despite their colonial expansion, humanity had remained secluded in their sliver of the Orion Arm, while the Covenant war machine marauded across space, seizing any relics of the forerunners they could find. The remote agricultural world of Harvest would become the site not only of first contact, but also of the opening salvos of the traumatic three decades long conflict known as the Covenant War. The Covenant had been drawn to Harvest by one of their luminaries, 
which had targeted what the aliens believed to be an extraordinary cache of relics on the surface. The alliance was established with the purpose of searching out Forerunner artifacts. It appeared that Harvest was full of these sacred and mysterious treasures. However, the truth was very different. Locked aboard the Forerunner Dreadnought, which powered the city of High Charity, the Ancilla, once known as Mendicant Bias, was now referred to as the Oracle. Though only intermittently active, it was periodically consulted by the Sanshayun Prophets to aid their decisions. The Oracle revealed to three curious prophets that humanity had been designated Reclaimers, a species selected by the Forerunners as inheritors of their legacy. It was not then a cache of relics that had attracted the Luminary, it was the humans themselves. The three Sanshayum concealed this shattering revelation, and the secret became a tool in their own struggle for power. Meanwhile, a single Covenant ship was sent to make peaceful first contact with the humans on the planet's surface, a mission that went terribly wrong. The tense ceremony was interrupted by mistaken weapons fire from a lone Covenant soldier, igniting a bloody gunfight between Harvest's raw and edgy local militia and the Jeral Hanai, the Covenant's brutish shock trooper species. A brief but ferocious siege of the planet by the Covenant cruiser Rapid Conversion followed. Though its Gerald Hanai commander, the chieftain Maccabeus, perished during the battle, the Covenant seized control of the entire colony. The Sanshayun prophets who had discovered the truth about humanity exploited this information. Becoming the High Prophet Triumvirate, controlling all Covenant matters. Rather than offer the humans a truce or an opportunity to join their alliance, the Prophets painted them as vermin, infesting and desecrating the Forerunner's holy possessions. Ord Casto, Laud Moran, and Hod Rumd, now respectively known as the Prophets of Truth, regret, and mercy, would maintain their power through the remainder of the Covenant War, a war to exterminate the human species. Unaware of the devastating assault on Harvest, the UNSC first discovered that something was amiss when communication was lost with the colony. They dispatched the scout ship Argo to investigate in April 2525. The vessel was destroyed almost immediately upon entering the system. Fearing rebel occupation of the colony and blind to the true nature of the enemy, a battle group was deployed. The battle group discovered a single Covenant warship orbiting Harvest and found that the colony had been bombarded from space and nearly obliterated. Two of the human ships were swiftly disabled by the Covenant vessel, while the lone Hercules desperately engaged its slipspace drive and narrowly escaped. The ship returned with a single chilling message. An alliance of aliens calling themselves the Covenant were bent on the complete eradication of humankind. The UNSC immediately went on high alert. Vice Admiral Preston Cole assembled the largest fleet yet deployed by the UNSC and brought it to harvest in March 2526. A total of 40 warships under Cole's command engaged the alien enemy. Though Cole was victorious, the UNSC still lost 13 vessels to a single Covenant warship, a grim assessment of the strength of their newfound foe. Meanwhile, reports of other colonies losing contact began to multiply. The world of Harvest had not seen the last of its struggles. The 
determined to take back this colony and unaware of how vast their enemy truly was, the UNSC redoubled their efforts. Battling Covenant ground forces across Harvest's mangled surface and in the space around it. This conflict continued for five years, until at last the Covenant released its hold and fled the Epsilon Indy system. The UNSC eventually discovered the reason for the Covenant's persistence on Harvest. Hidden in the planet's uncharted Arctic region, was an alien structure that predated the human colony, and even the Covenant itself. A buried forerunner facility. Humanity started to piece together clues about the Covenant's military goals, and also began to open their eyes to the secrets of the forerunners. What the UNSC did not know at this time was that the technology of the forerunners would ultimately present their greatest hope against the seemingly unstoppable Covenant, though this would become clear only at the very threshold of humanity's extinction. The first few months of the Covenant War saw many swift and gruesome tragedies strike the outer colonies. Attacking fleets would first cripple a colony's ability to call for help, then unleash a vicious orbital strike on population centers destroying any hope of mounting a resistance. Sometimes the battle would be taken to the colony's surface, with UNSC military forces engaging with Covenant across the very worlds they had previously called home. This contest may have been futile given the Covenant's overwhelming technological superiority, but from it came stories of valor. For the first time in millennia, Humanity was united against a single enemy. Toward the tail end of the five-year conflict at Harvest, the events involving the UNSC Spirit of Fire and her crew offered eerie clues to what the war would hold for humanity, and a solitary hope for victory, which would only become apparent decades later. The ship would find its way to one of the Forerunner's astonishing shield worlds, teeming with impossibly powerful technology and hiding a dark secret. On February 4th, 2531, the UNSC Spirit of Fire, commanded by Captain James Cutter, began military operations on the besieged colony of Harvest. This immense support vessel deployed troops and material to the surface overwhelming the Covenant's last remaining groundside forces while the war raged on in other parts of human space. When the ship's crew discovered that the Covenant had been excavating an ancient alien facility that predated humanity's occupation of this world, they immediately sent a team to the site, including leading xenobiologist Professor Ellen Anders. The team discovered a holographic map room pointing to the human colony of Arcadia. The Covenant, for reasons that remained a mystery, was already en route to the location. Spirit of Fire followed closely behind. Upon arrival, the Spirit's sergeant, John Forge, fought alongside Spartans originally deployed by the UNSC to defend the planet. Their efforts forced back the Covenant invasion, buying time to investigate the alien's presence on this colony. The Covenant had discovered something in Forerunner ruins deep in Arcadia's jungles, but before the Spirit's crew could determine their target, their enemies abducted Professor Anders from the artifact site and fled into slipspace with the Spirit of Fire in pursuit. The chase took them all the way to a remote, artificial world unlike anything humanity had ever seen. A shield world. One of the Forerunner's unbelievable creations built during their war with the Flood. On the surface of this strange new world, the Spirit's crew encountered this ancient parasite. The Flood had somehow escaped its containment on the installation. After narrowly surviving the outbreak, 
on her dispatched forces to take Anders back. The Covenant's plan now became clear. The Forerunners had kept an entire fleet of powerful warships within this particular construct, ready to be deployed at the command of a Reclaimer. A title that Anders now discovered had been bequeathed to humans by the Ancients. When Anders was forced by the Covenant to activate this fleet, Spirit's crew realized that they needed to destroy the Shield World, taking the Covenant, the Flood, and the Forerunner fleet with it. In order to do this, the Spirit would have to relinquish her slipspace drive, converting it into a bomb. Sacrificing his own life, Sergeant Forge activated the drive causing a stellar collapse of the artificial star at the world's center and completely obliterating it. Spirit of Fire narrowly escaped the destruction, but the ship was now stranded, forced to crawl at sublight speeds back to human-occupied space. Although Spirit of Fire would be declared by the UNSC lost with all hands on February 10th, 2534, the remaining crew remained in cryo storage as the ship began the long journey back home. The story of the Spirit of Fire was not yet finished. In the first few years of the war, the Covenant had already discovered over two dozen human colonies and destroyed them without warning or mercy. Before the UNSC understood the severity of this new threat, entire worlds had been blinked out of existence, using a procedure the Covenant referred to as cleansing. The immense alien fleets would unleash superheated plasma across a planet to scour it clean of human life. Sections of the world's surface would be entirely melted, leaving a lifeless, vitrified substance leading the humans to refer to this procedure as glassing. The Covenant dominated space combat. They possessed naval and weapon technology that greatly surpassed that of humankind. Spartans, however, offered a glimmer of hope for the UNSC. Humanity's super soldiers were not only a match for the Covenant's formidable sangheli led military on the ground, but also in space, as they could infiltrate and execute missions within enemy vessels, in rare cases even taking down entire warships and fleets with only a handful of operatives. Despite the victories Spartans had won against the Covenant, Little overall could be done to stem the swelling tide of destruction. This period would come to be called the Massacre of the Outer Colonies, and would see the ruin of dozens of humans' world. By 2535, most of the Outer Colonies were charred husks, laid waste in short, brutal engagements. Evacuation craft that managed to escape were often hunted down and destroyed before fleeing the system. Only on occasion would pockets of refugees survive to reach the relative safety of another colony. A handful of human worlds managed to prepare defenses in advance, supported by the UNSC fleets and detachments of troops. But even in those scenarios, the Covenant rarely needed to take the fight to the ground, as their naval strength usually subdued the world without difficulty. The UNSC eventually recognized that the Covenant were often led to human worlds by data received from colonies which had already been attacked. Navigation databases recovered from human vessels had also offered the Covenant slipspace routes to other colonies drawing the enemy to new prey. To prevent this, in the early years of the war, Admiral Preston Cole submitted a universal standing order commonly referred to as the Cole Protocol. This order dictated procedures for ships departing from any engagement with Covenant forces. Navigation databases had to be destroyed, 
all onboard AIs had to be purged, and ships could only leave on random course headings. This was to ensure that the Covenant could not discover the location of Earth or any remaining inner colonies. Despite its secrecy, the Spartan II program had been such a success that it had attracted the attention of the ambitious and shrewd Colonel James Ackerson. Although he was a rival of Dr. Halsey's, Ackerson acknowledged her genius, piggybacking on her advancements. He secretly proposed a successor to the program, Spartan III. Ackerson wanted to streamline the previous hardware by providing a more affordable armor system than Mjolnir, and to build on technological improvements in the past few years to generate more candidates. For Ackerson, more Spartans meant more victories. The highly classified Spartan III program began in December 2531 and was engineered on the secret world of Onyx. To run it, Ackerson recruited Chief Petty Officer Franklin Mendez, who trained the previous class of Spartans, and Kurt 051, now known as Lieutenant Commander Kurt Ambrose, a Spartan II with impressive leadership skills. Several companies of Spartans were created from colonial children who had been orphaned during the course of the war. These child soldiers were to be clad in the extremely advanced semi-powered infiltration armor, which incorporated improvements gleaned directly from Covenant technology. The very first company of Spartan III's Alpha Company began training in December 2531. Although this company successfully participated in a number of dangerous operations, nearly all of its Spartans were lost during Operation Prometheus. The Extreme Risk mission sent the Spartan threes to a Covenant shipyard on the asteroid K749, where they destroyed the site's plasma reactors, crippling the Covenant's naval efforts on the front lines. In July 2537, Beta Company was formed from the second wave of Spartan Threes. They would go on to complete a number of missions, eventually culminating in Torpedo, the destruction of a vast Covenant fuel refinery on Pegasi Delta. The refinery was critical to the Covenant's dominance in that region. The mission though successful, claimed the lives of nearly all members of Beta, except for Tom B-292 and Lucy B-091, who would return to Spartan III, helping to train the companies that were to follow. In July 2544, Gamma Company was activated. This time, as well as the standard Spartan III biological augmentations, Mutagenic enhancements were introduced. These illegal genetic modifications gave the Gamma Company Spartans more endurance and aggression under extreme stress, but required them to take a stabilizing drug for the rest of their lives. While most of Gamma Company was deployed in 2552, making them the last such company to serve in the war, a number remained behind for highly specialized training. This would prove fortuitous for the UNSC at the end of the war, as the Covenant eventually made their way to Onyx in search of the forerunner secrets the planet held. The bulk of the Spartans and these three companies were used in large-scale assaults on Covenant targets, missions that would claim the vast majority of their lives. A handful from each company, however, were secretly held back for incorporation into covert special warfare teams as part of the Headhunters initiative. Outfitted with Mjolnir armor similar to the Spartan IIs, these Spec Op Spartan threes would play significant roles during the remainder of the war, the most renowned being those of Noble Team. 
Spartan threes were created for high-risk, high-value military operations expected to result in massive casualties. Missions often referred to as meat grinders. O and I would deploy entire companies of Spartans directly at major covenant threats. Their whole lives in the program were designed to prepare them for the short window of a mission which they had little chance of surviving. Most of these heroic soldiers were only in their early teens. The period between the implementation of the Cole Protocol and the end of the war is often referred to as the Siege of the Inner Colonies. For humanity, this was a time of silent dread, frequently punctuated by the Covenant's ruthless eradication of a colony. Although human worlds were not being destroyed at the pace they had been earlier in the war, there was still little to stop the Covenant's steady advance through human territory. Although there were a handful of victories for humanity during the siege of the inner colonies, these were only minor setbacks in the Covenant's campaign. Propaganda and willful ignorance kept the innermost colonies and in particular the Sol system, detached from the actual horrors taking place. But for those who grasped the scale of the threat, the extinction of mankind seemed to be guaranteed. On July 17, 2552, Covenant scouting vessels struck the lush jungle colony of Sigma Octanus IV. Only a single human ship the UNSC Iroquois survived the initial attack. It was here that Commander Jacob Keyes displayed his naval skills by conducting one of the most impressive tactical maneuvers in UNSC history, the ploy that became known as the Keyes Loop. Keyes was no stranger to naval combat and already had decades of experience. His narrow but brilliant victory in this skirmish would finally gain him fame and the rank of captain. Only hours later, however, the enemy returned, this time bringing immense invasion scale numbers in the form of the Covenant's second fleet of Solemn Accord. The Battle of Sigma Octanus IV had begun. Marines and Spartans struck the heart of the Covenant's planetside invasion while the UNSC Navy fought in orbit. The Covenant's specific goals for this colony were revealed when Spartans located a concentration of enemy forces at a museum in the city of Cote d'Azur. The aliens were transmitting data from a fossilized stone recovered by human colonists long ago. Far above the city, a Covenant vessel attempted to capture this data but was waylaid by Keyes' Iroquois before it was acquired. The data was instead collected by the Iroquois crew, and amazingly, what was left of the second fleet of the Solemn Accord fled from the remaining UNSC forces. The unexplained victory at Sigma Octanus IV came at a critical time in the war, but it would be weeks before the true implications were revealed. Hidden within the data the aliens had so desperately sought were the coordinates for an ancient weapon far beyond the power of anything the humans or the Covenant possessed, as well as a secret that would forever change the course of the war. <laughs>